Can you guys hear me? Yeah? Super. I'm going to try and get this thing on the road. I'm already um, sad that I didn't make it two hours, but looking at the amount of people standing up, sorry that this is an hour. I hope you make it through. Um, there's some space here at the front. If people want to sit at the front, feel free to, like, when your legs just give out, come to the front and sit down. Um, all right, so welcome to the Creating Animations with Point Clouds tutorial, I think is what I call this. Um, we'll try and see if we can get through an entire animation, but I think uh, the way I record these and then bring them into Blender is probably the most interesting part, so I'm going to start with that. And then we'll move on and see what we can do with it in geometry nodes and, yeah, I don't know. I don't use my laptop that often, so if it crashes a lot, that's not me, it's a laptop. Um, so, first of all, acquiring these point clouds, how does one do so? I have an iPhone 12 Pro here, and it has a time of flight sensor on it. Um, they call it LiDAR. It's not really LiDAR, it's actually time of flight, but you know, marketing, what are you going to do? Um, but the cool thing is, you can just grab an app, put it on there, and you can just start scanning a whole bunch of stuff. Unfortunately, I couldn't find a video I recorded earlier to show you guys, but basically, it's really just a one-click solution. It's only on the iPhone 12 Pro, the 13 Pro, and the 14 Pro, and the, the larger ones. I haven't found anything for Android yet, but I do know there's phones with that same sort of sensor in it. If somebody does figure out how to do it on Android, please let me know, because I'd like to have it. If I, I can show it to people on other platforms as well, it'd be great. But for now, I just do this with an iPhone. Now keep that in mind when you see these point clouds, because they're actually quite interesting. Um, also, why a point cloud and not a mesh? Uh, I just think it looks cooler. It's really that simple. Um, it's sort of interesting data to work with as well, but we'll get to that when we get to that. So what do these point clouds look like? Um, the first thing I thought I was going to do is I was going to scan a point cloud of one of the men's bathroom and do something with it, but then I thought maybe that's a little too creepy. But at least I can show you the, the point cloud. So this is scanned in one take. There you can see the urinals. Got to love that. Um, and um, as we let it sort of build, you can fly around the point cloud a little bit. You can't see anything because I'm too zoomed in. Come on. Yeah, I don't use this application very often, as you can tell. But you can kind of see here through the window, we can see the, the bathroom stalls and that kind of stuff. And again, this is just from a phone walking around it. This took, I think, I don't know, a minute, even maybe even less. Just me waiting until everybody leaves the bathroom so I don't look like a creep. Uh, and then just kind of going ham. I had tea in my hand. I was like, Ugh, looking around. So it's kind of crazy to see what you can do with a phone. Um, these point clouds, they come up to about, I think it's 12 or 13 million points in a single scan. Pretty wild. Um, so for some of the people that know what I do, you know I've also done a lot of photogrammetry in the past. And photogrammetry is really cool, but it, you can't really scan anything reflective. So a lot of indoor areas are immediately just not easy to use and easy to scan. And this sort of solves that. You get some kind of funky color shifting on reflective surfaces, but it looks cool. So rather than doing the bathroom, I thought, let's just go for the full thing. And I have three clouds here. I have no idea if they're going to load in together. There we go. Um, these are three scans, and I managed to scan the entire staircase that we've all been going up and down the last couple of days. Um, so these are three scans combined. I use an app called Sitescape, S-I-T-E-S-C-A-E-P-E. -E. Anyway, come up and ask me if you can't remember. Um, I'll, I can show it later as well if somebody has some questions. And they have this little button, and it says 1 out of 10. And it makes you think you can do 10 scans consecutively, but only if you pay them 50 euros a month. But you don't have to. Because if you just end your scan and then stay in the same place, start a new scan, they all align anyway. So, ha ha. Um, <laughs> So that's kind of fun. You see I missed a little bit here, but that only adds to the fun. If we get into it, I'll load it up in Blender and then I'll be able to show you a little bit better because I'm, yeah, I'm not used to using this application uh, as much. So I'll show you two ways to get the scans into Blender. One is the cheap, aka free way, and the other one is the paid way. Paid way has some advantages, um, but I'll talk a little bit about both. Now, first of all, if I want to get these scans into Blender, um, has anybody here ever used PLY files in Blender? I'm not seeing a lot of hands. It's not a very common format. Um, the importer is fine, but it doesn't support vertex colors. And if I want any sort of colors, uh, I need to have those vertex colors because it comes into Blender as a mesh, as verts, and I need to kind of be able to yeah, do something with them. 
So fortunately, before I start cleaning up this cloud, I had it ready here. There are two ways to do this. On GitHub, there's somebody who kind of rewrote the PLY importer, and you have to kind of swap out some files in Blender. Um, but it means you can get vertex colors from a PLY file. And this one's, this is the free way that I was talking about. But you have to do a little bit of work. Um, but with that, you can only import stuff. And the thing is, you run into the, the sort of the limitations of the importer. Um, like I said, these scans are 12, 13 million points. You can imagine these, those three scans that I combined, if I'm trying to import like 50 million vertices, it's gonna take forever. It's gonna be a pain in the butt. So you need to do all the scan pre-processing before you bring it into Blender, rather than if you use this um, add-on, which I'm definitely gonna, oh, it's on sale now. Um, I'm definitely gonna plug, Jakub did an amazing job. Um, this add-on is called Point Cloud Visualizer. Uh, it is GPL, so I'm sure you could get a version somewhere, but for free, but um, I've been using this for the last year and a half, two years maybe. You can load up these really, really big scans into Blender. It takes care of all the drawing in the viewport, so it's actually pretty performant, and then you can do all the sort of um, processing and everything in Blender directly and convert it to something you can use in Blender very easily. But I'll, I'll show both uh, as far as I can. Um, but it's good to know, if you're gonna do anything with point clouds, honestly, it's the best 75 bucks I ever spent, so. Um, so what do you do when you're a cheapskate and you don't wanna pay for anything? Um, then you use Cloud Compare. Cloud Compare is also an open source uh, application. It does exactly what it says on the tin. It's for handling point clouds. Um, you can mesh them. You can do all kinds of crazy stuff to them. But mainly, I just want to load in the full set here and just show you the workflow. Uh, let's see, open I got my beacon folder. I'm just going to grab those three clouds, apply all. Really, all it's doing is it's telling me, oh, there's a bunch of data for each point. There's not only, I think, I don't think these do normals but they do vertex colors. So it's just saying, telling it, okay, apply all that data, keep it. I don't want you to throw it away. I want you to keep everything that's in those points. So now you can see there are three distinct pieces. So I started from the top, so that was my first scan. Then that's the last one, and that's one, one in the middle. The cool thing is, and I'll, I'll show you this in Blender later, because it'll be more easy for me to show you. The cool thing is, you can sort of see people walking past. So you get these shadows of people that are moving. It's really fun. So I figured we'd try to do something with this. Now again, I don't use Cloud Compare very often, so I'm gonna struggle through this a little bit. Um, I'm trying to, what am I trying to do? If it doesn't work, then it's not a big thing. Cloud, create single point cloud, there we go. Thank you very much. So now it just merges those together. We can turn off the other ones, and it didn't do what I wanted it to do. Gotta love that. Um, so yeah, basically, what you do is once you get all these together in Cloud Compare, then you've got this little button here that's called subsample a point cloud, and then you can just get a random sampling of a number of points. Um, I've rendered 50 million points in Blender. It's possible. It's not very fun to work with because it gets really slow because they're all vertices and it needs to do some conversion. So generally, I stick to about two, three million. I have a two million scaled down version of this. We'll see how well it works. I might have to scale it down a little bit depending on how the laptop does. But you could get a PLY from here, and then you could import it into Blender with that free tool that I showed you from GitHub. Or if you want to add an extra step to the, um, to the process, I haven't tested it yet, but I, but I came up with it two days ago, is then you can open this PLY that's merged into MeshLab, and then from MeshLab, you could probably export like an OBJ with vertex colors. If you want to overcomplicate it, go for it. There's probably simpler ways to do it for free, but I'm just really used to using this tool, and I'll show you exactly why. So if I were to just load one of these in, I've got it loaded up. I just get point cloud visualizer, I can go to the folder, and I'm just gonna load one of these raw scans in. And you can see it just dumps it immediately into Blender. I can manipulate it like anything else, and it looks really, really nice. And here I can actually go in and show you. See all these people? They give me weird looks. Um, I apologize if you're in there, but I always make sure people aren't you know, very recognizable, so. Um, but there you go, and then you get all those point clouds. Now, I'm not gonna do the whole process of simplifying it because it's easy enough to figure out. I'll show you where it is. Um, here you get this little point cloud visualizer thing. You can, why is there a gap in this table? You can um, just select it and then you go into, I think it's filter, and you can see it just goes forever. And you can do stuff like simplify, um, just a percentage or whatever. But actually what I wanna do is I wanna bring in a cloud that I've already simplified and then convert it to something we could use in Blender so we can get started in Blender finally. But it's cool, because 
Down here, you could convert it very easily and then points for mesh geometry nodes. So we're gonna dive into some geometry nodes uh, and then you can see me struggle through that. Um, but it's nice because it immediately creates everything you need to just get going. Um, but I'll, I'll obviously show you everything you need to know. And it's nice because you can just say, okay, I just want like 2% of these, convert this, and it's going to take a second. And there we go. Now we get 2% of these as vertices, and they have um, the colors in the vertex color, no, and the color attributes because we're changing names in Blender now. Um, and then you can do kind of cool stuff with it. But I'm going to bring in a cloud that I simplified earlier. So I'm just going to throw this out. And I'm going to do this with the point cloud visualizer just to keep it um, fast. And you can see I've already merged the three together once it loads. Please load. Why is this one taking forever? There we go. Um, this one's two million points. So you've see I already simplified it down quite a bit. And now we can actually start doing something with it in Blender. The only thing I still need to do is do that conversion. I'm going to start with... I don't know if two million points. I'm just going to convert it and see if it crashes or not. Yay, computers. Come on. We believe in you. You can do it. I'm going to flip my phone over. People sending me messages. Okay, there we go. It did it. So now we have a two million vertex. Um, mesh. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to slice off the top and slice off the bottom so we can make maybe a looping animation. I don't know. We'll see if we have time to loop it, but I definitely want to oh. let's undo that and go into wireframe mode so we can get all the points. Delete the top vertices, delete the bottom vertices. And this is already looking promising. So when I'm creating um, like looping animations, I'm always trying to make sure that I'm working with like predictable units. So what do I mean by that? I can see this is 20 meters tall. Is it 20? Yeah, I think so. So that means I can move my camera 20 meters. Things stay really easy to calculate. I can move the mesh another 20 meters down, and then I know it'll loop perfectly without having to go calculating stuff. Um, this is just force of habit, because I don't even know how many looping animations I've made at this point. But it's good to kind of get it in there while you're working. So what did this give us? First of all, let's actually render this and see what happens. I'm trying to turn stuff off. Okay. And let's put in a sky texture just to make things easy. And there we go. So you can see it immediately already renders because it's doing some stuff in the background. So first of all, it gave us a shader which is bringing in the point cloud colors that it generated, piping it through a gamma conversion, because I guess they do it in linear space or something, I don't know, as long as it works, right? Um, and then it's just giving me a diffuse shader. Now, why is this being rendered? Because they're just vertices, because we already also got a geometry node set up. And what it did for us, this little amazing node, it's called mesh to points. Basically what it does, you can get your um, edges or vertices or faces or whatever you want and convert them to a point. Now what is a point in geometry node? It's like an infinitely perfect sphere that isn't real geometry, it's sort of instanced render geometry, but it acts as a, like a normal sphere, but it, you can see it renders insanely fast. <laughs> Even on the laptop it's like decent. And you can set the size of it, so you can do some really fun stuff with it. Um, and this isn't working because I think you have to do it through the thingy here. There we go. So if we set them a little bit bigger, you can see they get bigger. And you can see our hallway is already starting to take shape. Remember, I just walked around with my phone. This is wild, right? Like, obviously, we are, most of us here are familiar with photogrammetry, but to me, this is just insane. You see all the different colored rooms, and the doors, at least, and we get a nice representation of the thing. Now, this is two million points-ish, because I cut off the top and bottom. We'll see, you might have to dumb it down once we start doing stuff in geometry nodes if it takes too long, but we'll see what we can do. Now, where can we go from here? Because really, all I need to do to make an animation uh, and be done with it is I set a camera, and some of you may have noticed that I put the top of the, um, the staircase at 0, 0, 0, and then the bottom is at about minus 20. Again, it's just because my brain sort of works that way at this point. I know if I have, let's see, 
let's do, obviously I won't be able to render out the complete animation. I'm just telling you guys that now. <laughs> Setting expectations and all that. Um, so now I can set it up to where um, I'm gonna do 240 frames and 24 frames a second. That's 10 seconds, should be fine. Um, and what we can do is at the first frame, we set a single keyframe on the z-axis for the camera, and then we go to two, frame 241 and set it at 20. Why do you want it at 241? Well, if you loop something, you want the frame after the last one you rendered to be the same one as the first frame that you rendered, because otherwise you get two of the same frames and it stutters. Yeah, I'll let you think on that one for a little while. Um, <laughs> so now what happens is we're moving through the thing, and I set it to plus 20 because I'm an idiot. And there we go, let's set it to minus 20. And now we're looping through the thing. So now you can see we're flying through the staircase. Hitchcock would be proud. And I'm gonna set up the camera like really extreme. We're gonna have fun with the camera and have like a crazy extreme angle. And it's still pretty, pretty decent. I'm still getting my four twenty-four full 24 frames a second. And that's the cool thing about working with this stuff in geometry nodes. It's actually really fast, so. Well, I say that now, and I'm gonna start doing stuff to it. Um, so the fun thing is, let me just check on the time. Okay, we're doing good, we're doing good. This'll work, this'll work. Um, so now, let's get really funky with it. So there's two ways that I generally animate these clouds. Um, the first is getting deep into the node tree and then hating myself when I open up the file again a week later because I didn't give anything names. And the second one is just use modifiers because modifiers are still incredibly powerful. For example, if we just throw in a simple to form modifier, where are we simple to form? Yes, there we go. Um, you'll see, I'll start doing stuff to it, but it doesn't work. Well, once you've turned this mesh into points with geometry nodes, Blender's like, this isn't geometry. So you gotta put it in front of the geometry node tree, so. But what we can do is, for example, we can twist it 360 degrees. Again, why do I do 360 degrees? Because of the loops. I'm always thinking how to loop stuff, so I have to get perfect connections between all the different parts. Um, but now we get this really cool sort of almost abstract staircase, and at this point, you know, let's just call it art and keep it, safe, keep it easy. Um, but you can see, you know, you can really start messing with your sort of sense of reality with these. Now, I don't know, I kind of like this, it's interesting, but let's get it, make it a little bit bigger. But you know what every good funky render needs? Fog, we gotta have some volumetrics. Um, and that's another cool trick I'll show you. I'm using a sky texture at the moment, and if we were just to throw in um, a volumetric shader in the world, slot, so let's go to world. Oh, constantly moving these things up and down. <laughs> there we go. Um, if we're just to grab a principal volume and plug it in, everything's black. Why? Well, this is a funky little head scratcher. Um, the sun texture is infinitely far away, and the world volume shader is infinitely large, so the light can never reach because they're canceling each other out. Yeah, took me a while to figure that one out. Um, so what do you do instead? You just grab a cube, scale it up, and really just put the shader on the cube rather than the world. So let me show you. grab everything. There we go. This is way too long, maybe, maybe not. Something like that. Make it a little bit bigger. Scale it up a bit. Scale it up like that a bit. There we go. And I just want it to be all encompassing and like big enough to where you get the effect. Now again, everything's dark, why? We're inside the cube. Um, but now we can give it that same principled volume shader. And I don't know why I'm doing this on a laptop, but there you go. And it won't load the first time you put it in because bugs. And then when you re-plug it in, or when you re-render, there it is. Why is it black? Because the density is too high. We set it to point 0.1, and now we get this really cool, atmospheric, random, trippy, abstract staircase. I don't know. Um. <laughs> the fun thing with this is that it reacts really well to the sun, so you get these really cool like sun shafts and all that kind of stuff. Um, let's see if we bring it down a little bit, and we can rotate it, and 
depending on how much time you would put into this, what I tend to do as well is um, if I fly through these, I'll animate the sun to like go 360 degrees and up and down. Man, you get some wild stuff. Um, yeah, lots of fun as usual. Now, this is cool. This is kind of the workflow for most of the ones that I've posted online and that kind of thing. But I want to dive into geometry nodes a little bit and really push it, really see how we can, you know, make stuff crash, because that's always fun. So I'm just going to turn off the volumetrics for now, and I'm going to turn off the modifier again. Um, really, I want you to just more, more be inspired by what I'm trying to show here, rather than show you like a very specific thing to do. Um, so, geometry nodes. Who loves geometry nodes? My homies. Um, <laughs> who hates geometry nodes and thinks it's needlessly complicated? Be honest, it's fine. That's what I thought first. So, okay. Um, so obviously, geometry nodes is pretty cool. Uh, the fun thing is because we get uh, that one from the, the add-on that I used, you would have to build this yourself if you import it through the other stuff. But honestly, it's just mesh to points. And then this set point radius, it's just to give you like a little control here. I never understood why they put it in there, I guess, so people don't have to look at the node tree because they might be scared of it or something, I don't know. Um, and then you gotta make sure you set the material of the points as well. If you disable this, they're just gonna be white and you're gonna be scratching your head for like 30 minutes. It's like, why is it just rendering the materials on? And then you're like, oh right, you have to set the material on the points because of geometry nodes. Um, but then we can actually get started. So somewhere in between here, we're, we're gonna do all the cool stuff. So I've been absolutely obsessed lately with, um, yeah, the, well, not lately, but I've always been obsessed with the art of, I'm not gonna say his first name because he's Polish and I'm gonna butcher it, but Bixinski. He's a, um, yeah, a Polish artist who made these absolutely beautiful things. Well, I say beautiful. Um, it's not for the faint of heart, so you've been warned. Like this is one of his more famous works and you can see there's just immense uh, amount of detail in there. This is not geometry nodes, obviously it's painting. So <laughs> mad props to the man. He painted that stuff by hand. We get to do it with nodes. Like this one's pretty interesting. You know, one could say it's even a little bit topical at the moment. Um, but yeah, all these like crazy worlds and, and really demonic things and yeah, just truly horrifying work. I love it. Um, <laughs> But I've always been inspired by that really, like these really detailed textures and there's like all these little fine sinewy things hanging everything together. So let's see how creepy we can get this staircase is basically what I'm trying to say. Yeah. First thing I'm going to do before I do anything, I'm going to drop in a delete geometry node. There we go. And I'm just gonna create a little control to where I can delete most of the geometry before I apply everything, because then I can work on like a sparse data set and then just turn it off once I'm done and just hope it doesn't crash once I'm done. Um, so to do that really quickly, you put in a delete geometry and then you have this little random value. And in the random value, you've got the Boolean value. And basically that's just gonna give you a selector, a Boolean selector for polygons, yes or no, with a probability of 50% by default. So if I plug this in here, this is gonna delete 50% of the polygons. Really quick and easy. Um, if you wanted to be a nerd about it, you could plug this into here and then use it here. I'm gonna set this to like 0.9. So I'm left with about 200,000 points because I started with 2 million. This should be fast enough to work with in the viewport. But again, yeah. I practiced this on my computer at home and then realized, oh right, you have to do this on the laptop. Uh. Um, but I do this anyway, just to keep things flowing a little bit quick. So first thing I'm gonna do, actually, where's my set hmm, mesh to points? Actually, I'm gonna put these somewhere else. I'm gonna do this whole conversion thing at the end. It's gonna make everything really messy, but that's fine. Put it in the geometry here and then plug that over there. Okay, I apologize in advance for the mess that I'm gonna make. There we go. So now we've got a clean working space to get started. So how am I gonna get all these really creepy lines and things? Um, I'm not gonna do exactly the same thing, but I'm gonna try to approximate it. So what we're gonna do is first things first, we wanna get a curve line, not a curve circle, but a curve line. There we go, let's put that somewhere over here. Dang it, not enough space. Um, and the curve line is just a line, I mean, I can show you. 
it's just a single curve line, but I'm gonna start scattering that onto the points. So get away, get out of here, you fewer. Um, and to do that, because the mesh is already points, what we can do is, actually can, do, can we do this after the point radius? Maybe we could. Sorry, I changed my mind about what I was gonna do today like five minutes ago, so bear with me. Um, so now we still have the points, there we go. I'm gonna set that material thing to the side here for now and just focus on this. So we've got those points, which is cool because then we can instance on points. And now we put these curves in here, so now we get lines on every single point. You can already see it's starting to struggle a little bit. I'm already hating myself for switching directions, but there we go. Um, maybe put this to point 0.99, there we go, that's better. So now we have a whole bunch of lines. And then what I like to do is just to give them random rotation. I'm gonna try and zoom in enough here and maybe, just maybe, a better idea would be to do this vertically. So then we can look at the tower and we give ourselves lots of space for the geometry nodes. Even though it runs horizontally, but you know, whatever. Um, so I'm gonna grab another random value because I will randomly rotate these. So, whoa, geometry, no, not geometry. Utilities, random value, and I know I can type, but I, I don't know why, I always do it through the menus. And I want a vector, because our rotation is a little blue thingamabob, which means it needs a vector, which means it needs X, Y, Z, so it needs three floats. And we can set the random value to vector, and that's just gonna give us um, random values between zero and one. Now, zero and one doesn't really translate very well to rotation, and this is where the fun starts. Um, for some crazy reason, this is in radians, so if we want to get 360 degrees, what's the quickest way? We do pi times two, enter, and we get 360 degrees. You get that one for free. Um, <laughs> what else do I want to do? I want to get a random scale, so I'm just going to duplicate this, and I'm going to set this to float, because I only need a single value, because I want to scale them uniformly. So I'm going to do 0.1 to maybe two, and now I got a whole bunch of really weird, creepy lines sticking out all over the place. So. Now, the fun part, now we're gonna map the end of each one of those lines to the closest point it can find. That sounds a lot more complicated than it is, um, but I just wanna say what I'm gonna do before I do it so people aren't like, huh? Um, so what do we need to do? We need to make a selection for the last point of each line, and we need to map that to, to the original geometry. So first of all, to make that selection, in the curve, um, and this is why I use the curve as an instance at the start and not a mesh line, um, you've got a lot more control over the segments and the points and all that kind of stuff. And we have this wonderful little thing called spline parameter, which doesn't explain anything. Um, but what it gives us in this factor, it gives us a value from zero to one from the start of the curve to the end of the curve. So the first point gets a value of zero and the last point gets a value of one. Now, because I created the line with two points, I get a zero at the first point and a one at the end point. There's my mask, I already have it. I don't have to do anything else for it, which is really nice. Um, the only other thing I need to do before I start manipulating these curves, these are still instances. So in Blender's brain, it's like, this is not real geometry. Um, which means if you're gonna do any sort of geometric operations on it, it won't work. So you need to make it proper geometry first. Which means, if I go to instances, there's this realize instances thing, basically it's gonna tell it, now make this just one curve object with a whole bunch of different splines in it. So when we do that, Nothing really changes. Again, I could open the spreadsheet, but we're not here to look at spreadsheets, are we? Um, but it's good to know. I'm just trying to explain the idea behind it. So basically now, we have to think of this in curve terminology. This is now a single curve with, I don't know, a few thousand splines in it, because each curve segment that is separate, well, not separate, but each separate curve is made out of its own splines, which are the pieces between the points. I'm just trying to iterate this so you, know, you can kind of follow along, I guess. So how do we map this now? Now, my favorite node to do this is the geometry proximity node. Basically what you can do is you can tell it, okay, I want this target object and then I want you to find um, the closest points to the geometry that I'm messing. Even I have a hard time explaining it. I just, you know, that it's in, in the name for this one at least. But what I wanna do is I wanna grab this realized um, instances. I wanna plug it into the target because I wanna map it back onto itself. But what I want to do is I want to now set the position. Um, let's see, if I just set the position here, then what it's going to do is, 
nothing because this is only for a mesh, so I have to convert the curve to a mesh first, and then it should work. Um, let's see if it did anything. It did not. Lovely. Um, I'm going to map it to the points. I'm already regretting my decision. <laughs> These are realized instances, so that should work technically. Why isn't it working? I did. It's in here. Oh, yeah. Uh, so that one should set. Wait. Now I'm confused. Um, okay, let me run through it here. So we've got our geometry. We need to. Uh, sorry, I stayed out a little bit too late last night, so it's my own fault. Um, so we need to grab this. I need to mask this. We have the selection, so I need to put in the factor. So that's my selection, and then I should be able to remap that geometry. Why is it not doing what I want it to do? It's going to be something real stupid if I offset it. It's doing something, but it's not working the way I want it to. Or is it? <laughs> Jesus! Just work, will ya? I think the problem is that you're calculating the closest point to every point, but that's just the point itself, so you're just setting the position of the point to itself, its own position. Oh, yeah, of course, I'm doing the... Th yeah, 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 I need... <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I don't need the instances. Props to that guy. I need, this, I need the dang points. So once I put the points in here, there we go. Now we're going to get what we want. Thank you. Good, sir. Turns out I'm only human after all. Um, so now we can get a really kind of messed up, creepy representation of this hallway. And that's kind of what I was after. Um, we can go really far and then now start displacing this a little bit. So again, what I'm going to do is now that I have these curves, this same spline parameter is still giving me a 0 to 1 to the end of the curve. doesn't matter. The curve's the same thing. Um, so the cool thing is what we can do is now we can resample this curve. So what's that going to do? Basically, like remember I said earlier, it's just two points. It's the first point and then the remap point at the end. But by resampling the curves, we're creating new points in between. Um, you can do it either by count or by length or whatever. Well, let's say I want every curve now to be 32 points. Why am I doing this? Now I can start doing cool stuff with the curves themselves and I have a little bit more geometry to work with. So I'm going to use the same spline parameter. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab a color ramp. And the color ramp, I'm going to plug it in here. Um, Really, I'm just using this to remap the mask. So remember the spline parameter, 0 to 1, start to finish. I'm going to set this from 0 to 0.5, and I'll make another swatch, and then set it to black at the end. Come on. There we go. And now it's just giving me a mask that's nothing at the beginning and end, and 100% towards the middle. So now I can wiggle around the middle of the curve, but the, the start and end points stay the same. So now it gets super interesting. Um, and again, let's have some fun with this. We're going to go for another set position. Who's regretting they joined? You can be honest. You can even walk out. It's all good. I understand. Um, so let's see. Now we can set the position, and then we do the thing with the, with the textures. So now we get a noise texture. Again, um, a noise texture outputs R, G, and B. So really, we have X, Y, and Z. If we think about it, we have three channels. We can convert colors to vectors very easily, so we get a 3D sort of noise to push stuff around. That's exactly what I want to do. I want to offset, basically, these things. And you'll see if I just plug it in, you'll see the noise starts offsetting all the little things. And the cool thing is, once I plug this into the selection, you'll see the base points stay the same. And I'll fix this in just a little bit. But you can see, as I scale this up, the starting points stay the same, the end points stay the same, but everything else kind of gets pushed around. Now, one problem is it's going in this weird one direction. Why? Well, yay vector math. Um, basically, you want stuff to go negative z and positive, or negative x, positive x, you know, negative y, positive y. And because we're only getting from black to white in, from the noise texture, we need to remap it. The easiest way to do this is um, to create a vector math node. And um, this is the part of the presentation where I wish I paid more attention in math class. 
And what we can do is we, if we subtract 0.5, because we know the values are going from 0 to 1, if we subtract 0 0.5, basically now we have them going from minus 0 0.5 to 0 0.5, which means we get noise in all directions. I know, right? But the cool thing is you can now see we're only affecting, um, we're actually kind of affecting the noise in an interesting way. We can add another vector math in here, set to multiply, and really all that's going to do is it's just going to give me like a slider to multiply the value of like the displacement of the noise. And you can see the, the first points, they kind of stick, and everything in between goes a little bit haywire. And because you could use like a map range or something for this as well, or other things, but I like a color ramp because it's really visual and you can really tell how you're uh, manipulating the mask. So I'm going to add some more points here, and then set this to B-spline, and now we get a nice fall off uh, that we can control mask-wise. It doesn't do a lot, but it's just a, a little bit to kind of make it control it. There we go. So now we've made, made something absolutely horrendous. Let's actually try and render it and see what happens. Obviously nothing's going to happen because these are still curves. I don't even know why I hit render, but there you go. And we need to change these curves back into a mesh. We're going to do that with the curve to mesh node. Woo! Um, and then the only thing we need is a profile curve. So again, we're going to grab a curve primitive, which means uh, we use that line at the start. So we're going to grab a circle. Set the resolution. I always set it to the lowest to begin with because once you have like thousands of curves and you start upping the resolution, exponential calculations, things go bad very quickly. I'm also going to save at this point. Yes, thank you very much. Um, although, to be honest, I do stuff where I get up to tens of millions of polygons with geometry nodes and then after two or three hours of work, I'm like, ooh, I haven't even saved yet. Cool. It is incredibly stable. It's very cool to see. Um, so props to the developers. Maybe we can give them a hand. Yeah. And now we can make this a curve. And now we just get a white thing. I'm going to hedge my bets here and just throw in the set material and see if it still works. And otherwise I have to do the whole capture attribute, transfer attribute thing, which always confuses the heck out of me. But now we have all those vertex colors because they transferred over to the curves. Yes didn't have to do any work for that. Um, and basically, now it's just a case of seeing how far we push that displacement. Maybe we can turn on the modifier again. Let's just see how many curves we can render before everything crashes. So this is the, uh, let's say, experimental part of the, uh, let's do a full screen because we're badasses. Let's turn on the volume. There we go. And let's say there's no animation in this, so what I could easily do to loop this uh, without having to deal with multiple objects is if you add this to its own collection, and I'm going to call this ins for instance dot loop dot zero zero zero. There we go. Now, because this, this is in its own collection, what you can do is you can use a collection instance to bring that exact same mesh back into Blender. But because it's an instance, it doesn't take more memory, so you can just uh, move it down, so gz minus 20. See where that minus 20 comes in now? Pretty sweet, right? There we go. We do it a couple times. And if anything, I might have to put one up at the top. Now, if we move our camera, you can see first and last frames, they look like they follow up perfectly. So, yes, even managed to loop it. Yeah, there, there should be more stuff at the top, exactly. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to grab one of these instances, duplicate it, move it up 40 units. See, again, where all this stuff. Preparation is everything, um, says the guy that forgot which node to use. Um, so then we put in the volumetrics. I'll turn them on later, but they usually work better when you have a lot of geometry and it's a bit more watertight, so the light sort of leaks in a little bit. If you have just very open geometry, well, yeah, you're just going to get like a lot of volumetrics. So this is where the fun, fun starts. We're going to grab that mesh to points. So I'm going to hit save, and let's just start bringing up the amount of things. So this is going to be about 200,000 points. And then we'll look at how many faces and triangles it is. Let's look at our RAM. Ooh, it's not even, it's not even doing anything. <laughs> oh, oh, there we go. I'm just going to leave this running in the background. Ooh, it's swapping. Ah, yeah, I only have 16 gigabytes, but will it blend? <laughs> oh, yeah. All right. 
Look at that. Doesn't that look amazing? I can even fly through it. Oh, it's, no, oh, stuff's disappearing. So you know you've gone too far with geometry nodes when stuff just randomly starts disappearing. See, this is my mesh. It doesn't know what to do, but it does render the instances. <laughs> Go figure, right? Don't you love being a CG artist? Okay, let's bring it down a little bit. But again, you can see we're at 16 million faces on a laptop with 16 gigs of RAM. Like, that's pretty decent. Come on, you can do it. Oh! I believe in you, little laptop. You can do it. Wait, let's close all the other stuff that's going on. Let's really maximize our chances here of getting a cool render from this. Die, die, die. There we go. I don't think that's taken up a lot of RAM. That should be fine. Um, open recent, under conference. What time is it? Ooh, still got 10 minutes. Oh, apparently I saved it with all the crazy stuff. Ooh, I might have backed myself into a corner here, so let's see. Let's bring it down to, what is it, 100,000 points? And remember, this is 100,000 points that all have a line that each have 32 subdivisions that each have three polygons going around it for each one of those subdivisions. That's why it gets crazy. So that's why you start with three things going around. Um, what I could do if it, it just refuses to load. Oh, no, I hit it like an idiot. There we go. Yes. OK. Try one more time. You can do it. You can do it. Can we break the 20 million polygon barrier? I think at this point, we're all just asking that question. At least I am. And then if you want to get really, yeah, I don't think we're going to do 20, but 15 should be OK. Come on. You can do it. I don't know. I don't think it's Blender. That usually holds up better than the laptop. Yeah. So let me put it this way. I run a Threadripper system at home with like 256 gigs of RAM. You can do lots of polys. Yeah. I found, depending on which nodes you use in geometry nodes, the limit is like somewhere between 25 million and 150 million polygons. And you'll see it breaking sometimes when you're in the, those upper ranges because it just like refuses to draw some of the mesh that it created. It just goes, no, nope, I'm up. Sorry, not doing this. Um, so generally what I'll do is if you want to optimize this now, the quickest way to do so is just convert it to a mesh. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit save and then uh, apply all the modifiers and see what happens. I should have just set this back to the normal value. <laughs> But I want to twist it. You can see, let's render it one more time. And we'll add the volumetrics. We'll go for the full thing. We're at 15 million faces. Yeah. Whenever I stream on YouTube, people are like, you're just showing off with your computer. I'm like, no, you actually need a decent computer to go really, really far. There we go. There's those streaks of sun we wanted. So we can even push it and see how far we can get it. So as you move up the sun elevation, you'll see these really cool streaks of light running through it. You can up the strength a little bit. And you can see how much fun you can have with this. Like once you have these setups, then it's just a case of bringing in new models, loading on the geometry nodes set up to it, and you're good to go. So, And you get really interesting results every single time. Obviously, this is not a staircase anymore. I mean, you know. <laughs> I'm not going to sit here and try and convince people of that. But you can see the big mess that we've created if I turn off the cube again. So this is what happens when people give me an iPhone. I start scanning stuff and then bringing it into Blender. And again, like I said, it's interesting to see how like, an artist that I've loved for years, now suddenly I'm finding these tools that are allowing me to kind of play with those ideas and replicate them somehow. And I'm, my mission isn't to do the same thing, but yeah, this is lots of fun. I think if we really wanted to optimize it a little bit more, what we could do is just go into the geometry nodes setup again. I mean, let's go for the, this is still a pretty small tree. Um, 
one of the things we could do is play with the curve count here rather than doing 32 subdivisions. We could bring it maybe down to 16 and that could be a little bit quicker. It's all up to you really. You could even uh, throw a subdivision surface modifier on top of this at the end if you wanted to. Um, because when you use the subdivision surface, as far as I know, in geometry nodes, it's not GPU accelerated, and when it's at the end of your modifier stack, it is GPU accelerated, so you can get pretty quick subdivisions if you use a modifier on top of the geometry nodes. There you go. Um, so you see, now we're down to only seven and a half million faces, but now it's a bit more responsive, and I mean, the effect is quite the same. We can even fly through it in real time almost. And we get what we want. So, yeah, I hope you learned something. <laughs> and just to finish up real quick, and I guess I'm plugging myself, but it's not really the point. It's just I want to show you some of the stuff that you can do with setups like these. And if I can find my... <laughs> Yes, as you can see, I take social media very seriously. Um, but as you can see, this is what happens when you get like three meshes of people through each other and you apply some of those techniques. You can get some really creepy stuff as well, which is awesome. Um, and again, these are self-portraits. So I just scan myself with the, the face ID camera of my iPhone and then put it through geometry nodes and played around with it. So it's just another case of um, looking real sultry there. Look at me. Um, and these as well. This is really interesting. Oh, yeah, Twitter, you can screw me over. Don't do me like that. Okay, Mastodon it is. Then I'm going to plug Mastodon. If you're not using Mastodon and you love open source, it is an awesome platform. It's like Twitter without the bullshit. Um, but I have to be logged in. Dang it. Can I see my thing? I don't know. No, is it at Mantissa? Yay! There we go. Um, and this is like, this is some really cool stuff where uh, I add in vector snapping. So it's the same technique, but what vector snapping does, it, it gives you a way to snap those lines to an increment. So you're like, if you put in 0 0.1, all the vertices are going to snap to like cubes of 0 0.1. But if you put a, pe a texture in there, you can see it sort of starts here and then it grows and then like the cubes grow. And so, yeah, once, once you get into it, it's wild. Um, but yeah, if you have any questions, I'll be around. Um, thanks for, for joining and I hope you had a good time. <laughs>